the Lord Jesus walked triumphantly into Jerusalem. He walked riding on a donkey as the king who was pre-announced in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. And on that day, the people were throwing their clothing and they were throwing the palm branches in front of him and crying out Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it says specifically in verse 10 that when this happened, Matthew 21 verse 10, the whole city was moved. And they asked, who is he? And I pray that indeed we will be such people that will move the city with our shouting not by words but by lifestyle that indeed there is a king in our midst. His name is Jesus. Jesus. The world needs to see a reigning Christ in our midst. It is only then that the city will be moved. Let's bow our heads in prayer this morning and ask the Holy Spirit to address each and every one of us on this day when Jesus proclaimed himself as king riding on a donkey when the crowds shouted and proclaimed him king that we will be such people that will shout and proclaim Jesus king by words and by lifestyle so that the city will be moved. Let's pray that each one of us this morning will be such an element of moving the city around us that we will not be silent people, that we will not be compromising people, that we will be faithful people, that the world will see that there's a king reigning in our hearts. I'd like to ask Brother Labib and Brother Tony to lead us in prayer this morning as we prepare our hearts to hear God's message. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to be in your presence. As we always come into your presence and you give us our food that we in need of, we thank you that you prepared what is very important to our life today. Help us as we reflect on that day that you came to our world and you walked the streets and you saw everything that we see in our days. And you saw, you saw the humans, how they are and how they behave. Yet you loved us so much, Lord, in your majesty, in your holiness. You didn't look down at us and leave us alone, but you choose to put yourself on behalf of us to pay the penalty of our sins and our shortcomings. Help us, Lord, today to receive your word and learn and practice it and apply it to our daily life so we can show that we are really followers of you and you are the one who is in charge, in control of our life. So we can really feel that you are the king and you have the supreme power and say in everything in our life. Help us to follow your guidance and your direction. As we receive your word, we pray for our brother that you're gonna use him, anoint him, 
Thank give you. him word to word and by the Holy Spirit we are listening in your grace amen amen, amen. amen. Oh Lord, we come to realize not only this morning, but since you came to our heart by the Holy Spirit, that things are not attainable by our own meager mind, Amen. but by your grace, by your grace and by your grace only, the salvation that everybody is longing for and trying to work so hard for it their work is going to be in vain <coughs> it is not going to be accomplished the eternal life comes from the death of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross yes, the grave is the way the cross is the pay is the, is the price for, for him that he had to pay we don't have the price. We will never know how much the price is. The cross is for him to, to lead us in this shaky and difficult life. Yes. This life is so Fusion. tempting to take us sideways, downways, but not upways to him. Only him. <laughs> And by accepting His grace in our life, are we going up? Are we going up only by Him? By His death, we shall have life. And it's going to be eternal life. It's going to be joyful life. It's going to be abundance life. He came to Jerusalem as it was written on this very day. It was not a horse, chariots, or an army carrying him over. He came to us on a donkey. So we don't have to be fearing. So we don't have to go and hide, but to cheer and to love him and to cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna, only Hosanna is in the highest. No one else is coming to our help, but our Lord with all of his humility, all of his love. He did not come on a bomber. He did not come on a chariot. He did not come with a sword on a horse. He came with love. He came with understanding. He told us, I know you are weak, but I am giving you the word. I am going to strengthen you. I am going to enlighten your way. I'm going to show you the way. I am your way and the life and the truth. Whoever comes to me, shall never perish, but have eternal life. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to stand up, if you don't mind. Let's read those three verses from Matthew 21, verses 8 through 10. Let's read them together. Let's read them in the NSB today. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. Verse 9. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Verse 10. When he had entered Jerusalem all the city was stirred saying who is this? Amen. May God Bless his word to every heart this morning. It's a great message that the Lord brought to Jerusalem on that Sunday, Palm Sunday. I'm afraid most people don't understand what the message was. I'm afraid most people take it as a ritual. They don't understand that on that day, Jesus Christ, proclaimed himself king and the crowds proclaimed him king and it was because of that proclamation of Jesus as king that the whole city was moved 
We wonder what will move our world. What do we have to do in order to bring our neighborhoods to Christ? Our friends, our loved ones, our family members. What does it take for those people to be awakened and stirred up? What do we have to do? The text tells us what needs to be done. There has to be a king reigning triumphantly in our midst. Unless the king is on his throne in the church, the church will not have any effect in the world. See, this world is not paying attention to the church. Watch any sport event. It attracts people by the thousands. Watch any fun event, shopping event, and it attracts people by the hundreds. The reason the world is not paying attention to the church is because nowadays the world does not see Christ reigning in the church as king. And unless Christ is reigning as king in the hearts of the people of the church, that the world will see Christ, that he is indeed the king of this church and every church, then the world will not pay attention to the church. Because the only thing that will stir up the world and wakes up the world is Christ riding triumphantly. Raiding and riding triumphantly. On that day, people shouted. People threw their clothing. They cut three branches of palm trees and they threw them before him. And they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. It was only then that the whole city starts wondering what's going on. There's a king coming to Jerusalem. Unless the world sees a king in our midst, the world will not be moved. So I'd like to bring before you two things that we need to do as a church, as people of God, in order to move the world around us. And may the Holy Spirit teach me and teach every one of us today what we need to do as a church, as members of the body of Christ, in order to be movers of people around us. First thing is, we need to make Christ visibly the king in our hearts. Unless the world sees Christ reigning and riding triumphantly, the world will not be moved. They moved the whole city because they placed Christ as reigning and triumphantly riding in Jerusalem on that day. Is this what's happening in the church today? Is the shout of the church Hosanna in the highest? Is the church shouting loud to the world that Christ is the king of the church nowadays? I'm afraid not. I'm afraid not. I'm afraid the shout of the church is that nowadays of the wife of Phinehas. You remember Phinehas in the Old Testament? She was the daughter-in-law of Eli, the high priest. On a day when she was giving birth to her child, she heard that her father-in-law just died. 
and her husband died. She heard that the Ark of the Covenant was taken. And as she was having the birthing pains, the lady who was helping her said, Fear not because you're having a son. She said, I call him Ichabod. For the glory of the Lord has departed from Israel. I'm afraid the shout of the church nowadays is Ichabod. For the glory of God has departed from Israel. We need to bring back Jesus as king in our hearts, as king in the church, so that the whole city will be moved. Unless they know that these people have one king, they bow down before only one king. They don't bow down before anything else. Unless they see that, they're not going to be moved. But when they realize that we are different people, that we have only one master, that we answer to only one king, that we take commands only from one person, his name is Jesus Christ, unless they see that, they will not be moved. May God help us to be awakened so that we wake up the world around us. What brought the world to be awakened in the Roman Empire? What brought the whole Roman Empire to Christ? Why it was a church that where Jesus reigned as king and rode triumphantly. They looked at them. They were different people. They lived differently. They acted differently. They spoke differently. There was no compromise. The early church really stood firm that this is our path. We have one king and his name is Jesus. What woke up the dark ages from darkness? It was people who stood firm and said, no, we will not compromise. People like Martin Luther. I love that man. I've seen his movie probably a hundred or more times. And every time I see it, I learn something new. 1521, Martin Luther was invited to the city of Worms. To be confronted by Charles, Charles V, the king of the Roman Empire. And there he had to defend what he had taught in his books. That salvation is only by faith, only by Christ, and only through scripture. Sola fide, sola Christus, and sola scriptura. They told him this is against the teachings of the nominal church. Would you recant? And they're implying if you don't recant, you die. People don't live if they went against the teaching of the nominal church. And Martin Luther stood and he said, Here I stand. I can do nothing else. God help me. I want to tell you, people like Martin Luther did not bow down before anybody else but before King Jesus. And I want to tell you, Martin Luther and people like him shook the world at that time and they continue to shake the world to our day, our age. We need people like this in the church. We need people like Eric Liddell. I've told his story before. Eric Liddell, an athlete from Scotland. He was a runner. June, I'm sorry, July 1924. It was the Olympics in Paris. And Eric Liddell shook the world entirely by announcing he will not run in the race of the 100 meter for which he is favored because it was on a Sunday. Even though he was the only hope for England to win that gold for that race. He told them, I will not run because the race taking place on a Sunday, I will not run on a Sunday. You know what they said about Eric Little? Newspapers came out, 
with the front page a traitor to his country. Oh yeah. Even the king came and tried to convince him, do a sacrifice for your country. And Eric Liddell said, I will bow down before no one else but King Jesus. I will not run on a Sunday. Instead, he elected to run on a Wednesday for the 400 meter run for which he was not favored. And he knew he probably would not win it. But as Eric Liddell was preparing for that run, somebody came and slipped a small paper in his hand and he read it. It said, I will honor those who will honor me. Hallelujah. On that day, not only did he win the gold, but he set a new world record for the 400 meter run. Eric Liddell shook the world. And God honored Eric Liddell. He continued shaking the world because soon after that 400 meter run and he winning the gold, he announced that he's not going to be running anymore because he was going to become a missionary to China. They told him, but why don't you continue to run for Jesus? He said, no. King Jesus is asking me now to do something else. Eric Liddell bowed down before one king and only one king. His name is Jesus Christ. And the world knew it. And the world was shaken by it. 1981, they had that beautiful movie, Chariots of Fire. Some of you have seen it. That tells the story of Eric Liddell. We need people like this in our midst today, folks. If we are to shake the world, we need to be such people. Give me one person, one who's faithful and bowing down before King Jesus. And I want to tell you that one person will have more effect than 50,000 people claiming that they're Christian but they're living like the rest of the world. The reason the world is not being shaken by Christians is because they don't see too many Christians bowing down before only one king. The world sees the church acting like them. There's hardly any difference anymore between the lifestyle of people of the church and the lifestyle of people of the world. Why should the world be affected anymore? May God help us to be people who will show in word and in lifestyle that we bow down before only one king. That there's one king who's riding and reigning triumphantly in our midst and his name is Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, only then would the world be stirred up. Only then would the world start wondering what's going on here. Who are these people? And only then, and I'll come to the second point for my short sermon, they will ask, who is this? You see, it says, when he had entered Jerusalem, hearing all the shouting, people proclaiming him, King, King, throwing their clothes and their palm branches before him, him riding on a donkey, proclaiming through what the prophet said in Zechariah 9, 9, Behold, city of Jerusalem, your king will come entering on a, on a donkey. He proclaimed himself king and the people proclaimed him as king. The whole city was moved. And the next thing they did is they said, what? Who is this? You see, after we stir up people by showing them that truly Jesus is our king, they will come to you and ask you, who is this king of yours? Who is this Lord of yours? Who is this Jesus? And we need to be ready to give them an answer to their question. We have to be ready. We have to prepare ourselves. Not only to stir up people, but also to educate people about Jesus. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3.15, it 
and always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We have to be ready. The church needs more people to be true learners of the Bible. This book needs to become so familiar to us that we know the verses that are important and even the verses that may not look so important. We have to be able to answer with argument all those who are trying to find out the truth. When people come to you, you need to prepare yourself to answer. And I suggest that as the people that the Lord has put you in your circle of influence, prepare yourself. Did the Lord put you in such and such crowd with such and such religion? Prepare yourself for the questions they're going to ask. There are books that teach you where to find those verses and the ultimate book is the Bible. Prepare yourself to answer those who asked you about Jesus. As they see your lifestyle and they get stirred up that you are truly bowing down before King Jesus, they're going to ask you, who is this Jesus? I'm afraid about many Christians it can be said what was said in Hebrews 5.12 For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. I'm afraid that many Christians don't advance much in the knowledge of Scripture and in the knowledge in gr the grace of Christ. You ask a Christian, what's your favorite verse? And they probably tell you John 3.16. You ask them 10 years later, what's your favorite verse? It's still the same verse. I'm not putting down John 3.16, but if that's all we're going to be advanced in knowing from the Bible, one verse, the rest of our lives, that's not too much advancing. We need to be disciples of Christ who are learning at the foot of Christ so that we can advance in the knowledge and we can start living that knowledge. You see, Christ is not only learned by words. He has to be learned in the heart. He has to be lived. I like what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 1.21. He says, for to me to live is what? Is Christ. And to die is gain. But to live is Christ. The Apostle was saying, I don't want anything in my life to show except, by Christ, that, except Christ. My words to be the words of Christ. My plans to be the plans of Christ. My actions, the actions of Christ. My goings in and out are those of Christ. I want to live Christ. I want to love his people. I want to love his church. I want to be like him, man of the truth, of integrity. I want to be moved by his spirit. I want to walk like he walked. And I want to tell you, People need to see Christ in us, not only by word, but by also action. They will be stirred up when they realize you're bowing down before Christ, and they will come to be informed about Christ when they ask you, who is this? And knowing who Christ is will anchor them in Christ. May God help us to be those who stir up people and who also direct them well toward Christ by telling them who Christ is. You say to me, where do I start? I suggest that you start where Christ announced who he is. Remember the first time he walked to that synagogue in Nazareth? The city of his boyhood? That's where he grew up. And he walked into that synagogue in Luke chapter 4. And verses 16 through 19. And he announced his mission. Tell him who Christ is, why he came. That's what he said he will come to do. He said in Luke chapter 4 and verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And look at this word. And as his what? His custom was. I like it. Jesus had 
few things he was accustomed to do. One of them was attending meetings. Isn't that interesting? You want to follow Jesus, you want to be, have a custom of never missing a meeting. He had also another custom, it says in the Bible, that he always prayed. He was accustomed to pray. Luke 22, verse 39. And he was accustomed to teach people. Mark 10, 1. We don't have to look at those. He was accustomed. And then he says, and stood for to read, verse 17. There was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book to the place where he wants to read, it was Isaiah 61. He chose Isaiah 61. And then he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Christ's first mission is to bring the gospel good news. I think we need to tell people about that. Christ's first mission is to bring gospel good news to you. Sad world needs good news. How many of you are listening to any good news on the news of television nowadays? Is there nothing but misery on that television? I think I spare myself the misery by turning it off. And every time I turn it on, I say, oh, I'm shaking my head like this. And then we say, do we need to see more? Whether it's politics, whether it's what's going on in the city, whether it's going on in other nations, it's nothing but misery, but Christ came to bring good news to this poor world. And he says, also I came, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. Christ wants to release poor people who are in chains. In chains to their addictions. In chains to their bad habits. There are people who cannot break out but Christ came to release those people. And then recovery of sight to the blind. This world is blind. This world cannot see. Maybe they have eyes, but they cannot see the truth. Christ came to awaken people and let them see, give them spiritual vision to set free those who are oppressed. There's so much oppression in the world and nobody can release the oppression of this world and remove it except Christ. And verse 19, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. It's interesting. It's a year of favor, but it's a day of vengeance. To proclaim a new era for this world called the era of grace. What's grace? Unmerited favor to those who, who deserve the opposite. That's it. The God Instead of giving judgment, he's giving grace. Instead of punishing, he is bestowing. You say to me, wait a minute, the opposite of punishment is uh, mercy. No, no, on top of mercy is grace. Not only sparing you from the judgment, but giving you on top, way and above. It's the year of acceptance. The favorable year of the Lord. And then in verse 20, it says, And when he, as he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And verse 21, And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture was fulfilled in your midst. Jesus Christ announced in six items who he is. He is the Messiah. You see, this part of scripture Isaiah 61 was always known as the scripture that tells who is the Messiah. Christ. Who's God? Who's going to become a man? Who's the one who's going to reign? Who's the one who's going to redeem? Who's the king of this universe? He said, I am he. Today, you are looking at Messiah, he told them. I want to tell you, some of them liked it, but they were offended by that. They wanted to throw him off a cliff, but he walked miraculously through their midst. But that was the announcement of who Christ is, and we need to tell the world who Christ is. If I may suggest, let us tell them at least six things about Christ when they ask about who he is. 
Let's tell him that he's the mighty creative Christ. That's right. Christ who created everything. This world is so big. This universe is so huge. By the words of Einstein, he said, he thinks. Of course, Einstein had always imagination above science. He said he thought before he died that the world's circumference is about 210 six trillions light years. Try to figure that out. Is it as billion, trillion, quadrillion, quintillion, sextillion? I don't know how big that is, but that's too hard. But Einstein figured out it's that big, the circumference of the universe. I don't think even Einstein knew exactly what it is, but that was his calculations. With the Hubble telescope, our vision has been enlarged so much, we can see more galaxies than any other time. Today, it is estimated, and of course that number keeps changing, that there is presently, that we know of, 50 billion galaxies, and in each one there are hundreds of billions of stars. Can you imagine that's billions times billions of stars? I like that service. I don't know if you read, heard it on uh, radio sometimes. It says, name a star. You can buy your friend for his birthday, and they put his name on a star. And I figured, this is a great business because they never run out of stars. Of you know, they keep selling you. They say, okay, star this. You can give it your name of your friend. You pay $10 or $20 for that, and they sell you the name of a star. Very good business because there are billions upon billions of stars. Why? Why are there so many stars? Because I want to tell you, these stars are a tribute to how great of a creator is Jesus Christ. That's right. Christ created everything. The Bible says in John chapter 1 verse 3, all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. Can you imagine? You say, how many billions of stars are there? The Bible says that he named them by name. He knows the real name of every star. Jesus Christ created everything in this universe. We need to tell people that he is the mighty creative Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? He is the creator of the universe. And we need to tell them that also he is the compassionate Christ. Christ is not just a mighty creator, he's compassionate. He loves you. As we had, as we read, I came to heal the brokenhearted. So many times the word he had compassion is repeated in the Bible about Jesus. Just in Matthew alone, one time after another, Matthew 9, Matthew 14, Matthew 15, Matthew 20, compassion, compassion. Let's take Matthew 9, 36. It says, when he saw Matthew 9, 36. When he saw the multitude, he was moved with... What? He was moved with what? Compassion. Compassion. Jesus had compassion. Jesus loves people. Compassion is to feel with people what they're going through. You share in their sorrows. And I want to tell you today, if there's someone here with sorrows... Jesus knows and he's sharing your sorrows today. He's sharing in your sufferings. He's sharing in your difficulties today because he cares for you. We need to tell people that Jesus is the compassionate Christ. And then we need to tell them that he is the crucified Christ. You see, the reason Jesus came to this world was to be crucified. Can you believe it? Remember? John the Baptist, when he saw him, he announced it, he said, Behold the what? The Lamb of God who takes away the what? The sin of the world. He didn't say, Behold the nice prophet Jesus. Behold God in the flesh. Behold the Lamb of God who will be slaughtered to remove the sin of the world. The main purpose Jesus came to this world is to die on the cross so that he will take away the wrath of God because of man's sin. God had wrath. 
and that wrath was absorbed by the cross of Jesus. Only there is there salvation for mankind. First Peter 2.24 says, Who himself bore our sins on the tree in his own body, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, and by whose stripes we were healed. You see, as he suffered, instead of me, I was healed. I was forgiven the penalty of my sin. Jesus died as a substitute. He took my place, your place on that cross in order to pay for your sin. I like 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, The Father made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In Christ, crucified is the only way for forgiving your sins. All your sins. Past, present, and future. That's it. All your sins can be forgiven because Jesus was crucified on the cross instead of you. That's it. God can forgive all the sins that you've done or you'll ever do through Christ crucified except one. You know which one? If you turn down Jesus. If you don't want to come to the cross, there is no way out for you. This is the only bad sin that can never be forgiven if you turn down Jesus. We need to tell people that there is forgiveness because Jesus is the crucified Christ. And today, you can know that you are saved and if you die, you will go to heaven if you have come to Jesus crucified because of your sins. You'll be forgiven all your sins. And we need to tell people also that he is not only the crucified Christ, but also the conquering Christ. Conquering. Jesus Christ conquered death. Jesus Christ is alive. This week, the whole world will be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ and next week we'll be here speaking about this resurrection. But let me tell you that this resurrection is very important. You know why? A crucified Christ saves you once. But it takes a resurrected living Christ to keep saving you forever. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25, it says, Therefore, he's also able to save to the uttermost those who come to him because what? Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. A dead Christ will not be able to continue saving you. It takes a living Christ who intercedes on your behalf every single day. Who upholds you every single day. And who will be welcoming you in heaven on that day when you depart from here. It's a living Christ. The Apostle Paul puts it like that. 1 Corinthians 15, 14 it says, If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes. That's it. We don't follow just a crucified Christ. We follow a conquering Christ. One who's alive and who will keep us in the palm of his hand. And we need to tell them also that he is the contemporary Christ. You know what contemporary means? Means he's good for today. I like what Hebrews chapter 7, chapter 13, for, excuse me, Hebrews 13 verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, yesterday today, forever. and forever. The Jesus who saved the first generation and also the Old Testament saints is the same Jesus who can save you today. He is good for your generation. He's not an old Christ for old people. He's Christ for all people. Young and old. Educated or uneducated. Christ is the contemporary Christ who can save everyone who comes to him. And we need to tell him that he's also last the coming Christ. The coming Christ. You see, in that synagogue in Nazareth he said and to announce 
a year of acceptance of the Lord. And if you go to Isaiah 61, you will see in a day of vengeance. You see, Christ is coming back. We live in this year of acceptance. People say, how long is this? It's been a while, hasn't it? But I want to tell you, this year is going to come to an end. And if you are like me, you get calendars on the wall. Every time I hang a calendar on the wall, I watch those months go by one after another. I say, why do I have to get another calendar? Because I know it's 12 times and it'll be gone. You get a new calendar. I know Sister May is looking at me because we always order those calendars and we watch them. On. Now we are into April because I'm always ahead one month and we say, how many months are left? Jesus will be coming at the end of that year of acceptance of the Lord. There is a day when that year will be over and Jesus Christ is coming back. Yes. He's going to show up. And happy are those who are waiting for him. He promised it. The angel said he will come back. In John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, he gave that promise very clearly to his disciples. He said to them, he said in John chapter 14 and verse 1, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it wasn't so, I wouldn't have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will what? He said, I'm coming again. Guaranteed, I'm coming again so that receive you and where I am there, you may be also. Whether you are pre-trib, a mid-trib, or a post-trib, Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming. And he's going to show up. As he was ascending in Acts chapter 1 and verse 11, the angel stood by there and looked at the people who are watching him ascend before their eyes and they said to them, What are you watching for, you Galileans? Why? Men of Galilee, don't you understand that the same Jesus who was taken up from you shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Men of Galilee, the same Jesus going up is going to be coming back. Prepare yourself for that return. Prepare yourself for the day when Christ is going to come. You say to me, but it may not be in my lifetime, but I want to tell you whether he comes in your lifetime or not, your life is very short. Whether you say it's going to come in this few years, or after I die, it doesn't matter because when you die, you're going to meet Jesus anyway. And if you are in Christ today, having believed in Christ, the crucified, the conquering, the creator, the king, then you'll be spared and you're saved and you'll be with Christ forever. But if you're not in Christ today and you die without Christ today, you will never be with Christ again. You'll be in hell. Only those who are saved. The penalty of sin will be spared. The judgment. Jesus Christ is going to come. He's going to set a throne of judgment. And every soul that is not saved is going to have to give account to every word, every thought, every action that was committed. There will be a book where everything is going to be written. Nothing will be left. And people are going to have to give account. And the only way to be spared that judgment is to come to Christ today as a Savior. So I'll leave you with this. And I think that's what we should leave people when we tell them about Christ. When they we have been stirred them up and they ask, who is this? I think we need to tell them and we need to here today make sure we've done three things. Number one, repent. Repent. You know what repent means? Repent means is I declare that I have sinned and I don't want to continue sinning. That's it. Repent is I want to turn the direction of my life. I was going to the right, I want to go to the left. I was going backwards, I want to go forward. I want to turn around. I need help. It's a decision of a change of direction in my life. And then after 
having repented and God commands all people to repent, receive. Receive. Receive by faith the grace, this unmerited favor, salvation, free forgiveness of your sins, guaranteed eternal life. Receive it as a free gift for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, receive it by faith. Like the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Receive it by saying it, confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God saved him, raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Receive the grace, repent and receive. And then as you go one more step, reveal that faith. That's right, reveal that faith. People say, I'm a silent believer, there's no such thing in the Bible. Not a single silent believer is mentioned in the Bible. All believers revealed their faith in the Bible. And the Bible says, Luke 9, 26 says, Lord Jesus said, whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the son of man, will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and is his father's in the holy angels. Christ said, if you are ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. So I say, having repented, having received by faith, then reveal it. Declare it to the world. That's why God put an ordinance called baptism. He said, tell the world I have belong, I belong now to Jesus. I'm a follower of King Jesus. Declare it by word. Declare it by lifestyle. Declare it to, to the entire universe that you belong to Christ. The Christ is your king. Are you declaring it? Does your life show it? Do people are stirred by you, by your lifestyle? They see that you're different. Do they come and ask you, who's your king? Have you been asked that? I think it's good if people are stirred by you, by your lifestyle. I dare even say, have you experienced repentance? Has there been a turning point in your life? Has there been a change in your habits? Has it happened? If it hasn't, then you need to make sure today can be the beginning of a new lifestyle for you by coming back to Jesus, the crucified, the conquering, the creator, the compassionate, the one that's soon coming back. Jesus is here in our midst. And he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, open the door. I will what? Dine with him. I will come to him, dine with him, and him with me. I am here, the Lord Jesus says. I'm knocking at the door. Which heart will open up and say, Lord, I want you to be my king today. I want you to be my Lord today. I want you to be the one, the only one I will bow down before. Nobody else before you ever. Now or never. I want you to be the first and the last thing I want to live and die for. You do this. <clears throat> Not only you make sure that you have eternal life, but you become an instrument of stirring up the world around you and bringing them to Christ. I know... It's a big task when the Lord Jesus said, go unto all the world and preach the gospel. But I want to tell you, this is the greatest thing we can do to preach the gospel. That people will see that there is a king reigning in my heart. Let's bow down before the Lord. <clears throat> and as the whole city heard them say, Hosanna! To the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When they heard this and saw this, the whole city was moved. And they asked, who is this? They asked, who is this? So, I pray today that there will be people in our midst who say, I want to be such a person. I want to make sure that Christ is my king. I don't want my lifestyle to be compromising. I want to change my lifestyle. I want to make a turning point today. Today is a turning point for me. Instead of bowing down to the 
prince of this world, I want to I wanna bow down only before the king of the universe. King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus Christ is my king from here on. I want to receive him by faith as the one who was crucified, rose from the dead, who loves me and gave himself for me. And I also want to proclaim him to the world. I want to do this today. Today. I don't know how many people would say, I want to do it today. Raise your hand. Amen. 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 Let's all stand up if you don't mind. We're going to close with a word of prayer with Brother Mark Bidbaf.